thanks to Zach and Pastor Zach and his good work, and good thought put into that service. But um, it is, uh, in one sense, a, a time of, of lament, a time of, uh, of mourning for those who've suffered great loss this week, and uh, for those that will be in recovery, some for quite a long time, I would imagine. So, um, and uh, the prayers of God's people were being lifted up all over the city. Uh, all over Colorado, really all over the nation today, uh, and we'll continue in the days ahead as, as the, the stories continue to unfold. We were most uh, particularly impacted with the uh, 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 by the uh, uh, the Anderson family, uh, uh, Petra, uh, 22 years old, the daughter of Kim, and uh, who was just diagnosed, well, re-diagnosed uh, with cancer. Um, and herself is going through a long, dark journey, and uh, with that. So, uh, but uh, anyway, just to say that uh, there, uh, Petra is a and Pastor Brad. If you haven't been in first service, shares a bit of that story, and just uh, really, the, it's got miracle written all over it that she's still with us, and uh, remains to be seen whether she'll have any long-standing. Uh, disability from that. It uh, doesn't look like it right now, but she is still in ICU at uh, Aurora Medical South. And uh, so we, we stand with that family and uh, with all the others that are gathered there in the waiting rooms and uh, behind secured doors and all the rest. So um, I, we are delighted this morning as we continue our series uh, here on Can We Trust the Bible? Uh, what, a, what a great uh, time to be talking about that. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we're, we're just delighted to have Dr. Craig Blomberg, uh, a distinguished professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary here this morning. And uh, every, just every week has been fabulous uh, as we've had the, the gift and the blessing of so many from Denver Seminary and some from our own church here. And uh, that, that, of course, will continue for a few more weeks yet, uh, up until almost the end of August. Uh, we, this is an 11-week series on Can We Trust the Bible? So we're uh, uh, going to talk, uh, Dr. Blomberg is going to speak to us this morning on uh, what about other Gospels? And uh, let me just uh, share with you, this is the first time I've met uh, Dr. Blomberg, and what a privilege that is. He's uh, sitting beside him, of course, with one of his uh, students, Sarah Geis, and she is on our Adult Spiritual Formation Committee, among others, and uh, has done a great job in helping to orchestrate this whole series. So thank you, Sarah. And, uh, but uh, Dr. Blomberg completed his PhD in New Testament, specializing in the parables and the writings of Luke, the Gospels of Luke and Acts, uh, at Aberdeen University in Scotland. He received his Master of Arts degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, and his bachelor's as undergraduate from Augustana College, and before joining the faculty at the Edinburgh Seminary, I think in 1980, what did I say, 1986, uh, he taught at Palm Beach Atlantic College and was a research fellow at Cambridge, uh, England, with Tyndale House, in addition to uh, many, well, he's, I see you brought a few books with you this morning. That's always a good thing. Uh, prolific uh, author and uh, lecturer, professor, teacher, mentor, um, and, and I just have a feeling, uh, friend. That's, that's, uh, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll have coffee together and get to know each other even better. But anyway, let me open with a word of prayer and then uh, after which uh, let's welcome Dr. Lumber. Father God, thank you so much for this uh, this day. It's a, there's a heaviness in the air, and yet, Lord, we are a people of hope. Uh, and so uh, we continue, Lord, as we did in the last hour of worship, uh, lift up to you those who are especially affected and impacted by this, uh, by this tragedy. Uh, so uh, console and comfort our own hearts, uh, Lord Jesus. May your Holy Spirit um, bring peace and comfort uh, to us. And for we, Lord, who stand in the way of perhaps help, uh, being called upon to help others uh, through their grief, uh, give us wisdom, uh, give us love, give us patience and wisdom and insight. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will uh, bless Dr. Blomper. Thank you so much that he could come and be a part of our our, our community here, our uh, f faith, our fellowship, and uh, that uh, we could benefit from uh, his years of study and experience and the work of your Holy Spirit in his life as well. We greet him, Father, uh, as a brother in Christ, 
and uh, we ask that you will teach us through him in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Lombard. Summers ago, and that was the first time I had seen this room. So it's uh, good to see how the church is growing and expanding. We've been in the area 26 years. And in the early years, I knew several people who occasionally invited me to do something. And uh, so it's always been good to watch Cherry Creek grow. And I do need to, to make one very minor correction Pastor Bruce's introduction. Sarah was a student until she graduated just this last uh, spring and uh, won the award for top philosophy and apologetics student and now is uh, going to be a colleague as she'll be teaching a class as an adjunct in uh, the spring. So uh, she doesn't talk about that a lot. She probably shouldn't, but uh, you have a gem in your midst and uh, appreciate your, uh, your supporting her. I actually didn't bring any of my own books. I brought a Bible, um, and I brought some other books that I'll be reading from that uh, contain ancient literature. And um, hopefully you found a handout on your way in, and uh, for those of you who like to take notes, there is some white space where you can do that. For those of you who don't, um, We'll still have something to take home and decide what you want to do with it then. <laughs> Every few years, it seems like, something emerges in the news that draws the public's attention to the fact that uh, in the early centuries of the Christian church, uh, it was not nearly Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that were written um, that had the label gospel attached to them. And uh, many people know next to nothing about uh, what those other quote-unquote gospels are. And some people have heard a little bit. And depending on the sources, uh, it may or may not even be remotely accurate. Um, judging by the average age that I see in this room, which is quite different from the classes I teach, um, I suspect there are many here who uh, already have learned well um, to uh, use the internet and then test the spirits, as First John 4 puts it. Um, the more information that's out there, the more disinformation is also out there. So what are we talking about? There are two basic categories, and they represent the books I brought with me. There is a body of writing that has come to be called the New Testament Apocrypha, shall and tell. And this reflects writings uh, from the 2nd through 6th centuries AD that uh, took the form of all the genres of the New Testament. There were apocryphal gospels, there were apocryphal acts, there were apocryphal epistles, there were apocryphal apocalypses. Try that one a few times fast. <laughs> um, typically assigned to the name of a first century well-known Christian figure, but uh, not accurately because uh, none of them was written nearly early enough uh, to have been during the lifetimes of those writers. It's important to distinguish these works from what many of you will probably have heard of, and that is the Old Testament Apocrypha. Those are books that were Jewish, that were written in between the Protestant Old and New Testaments. They are found in Catholic Bibles. Um, 
that's another whole story. And if you want to invite me back to talk about it, that's fine, but that wasn't my assignment today. Um, these are books that we're talking about today that nobody has ever put in anybody's Bible. But they emerged out of Christian or quasi-Christian uh, groups or sects after the New Testament. And uh, it's worth asking what's in them. The other book, the other half of the first page of the handout, has to do with a group of documents that were discovered a couple of years after World War II in Egypt at a site called Nag Hammadi. And so creatively, they are called the Nag Hammadi Library. <laughs> These are, for the most part, Gnostic texts. And we will talk about what Gnosticism is in just a moment. But let's start with the Apocryphal Gospels as part of the larger New Testament Apocrypha. Some of them are what have come to be known as infancy Gospels. Not narratives of the entire life of Christ, but uh, stories designed to embellish and magnify and add legends to the early years of Jesus. Didn't you ever wonder what Jesus was like at three? Was, was he a child prodigy? Well, the New Testament tells us nothing other than one episode at age 12 where he seemed to have better than normal wisdom, but he certainly wasn't working any miracles. And he was described as growing in completely human form and obedient to his parents. But here are the opening lines of what is called the infancy gospel of Thomas. Thomas the Israelite tells and makes known to you all, brethren from among the Gentiles, all the works of the childhood of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mighty deeds, which he did when he was born in our land. The beginning is as follows. When this boy Jesus was five years old, he was playing at the ford of a brook, and he gathered together in two pools the water that flowed by, and made it at once clean, and commanded it by his word alone. He made soft clay and fashioned from it twelve sparrows. And it was the Sabbath when he did this. And there were also many other children playing with him. Now, when a certain Jew saw what Jesus was doing in his play on the Sabbath, he at once went and told his father Joseph, See, your child is in the brook and has taken clay and fashioned twelve birds and has profaned the Sabbath. When Joseph came to the place and saw it, he cried out, saying, Why do you do on the Sabbath what ought not to be done? But Jesus clapped his hands and cried to the sparrows, Off with you! And the sparrows took flight and went away chirping. The entire one, two, three, four, five and a half pages, it's not long, are nothing but a collection of miracles designed to show, well, I usually say Jesus the boy of wonder. Maybe that's this isn't the right weekend to make an allusion to Batman and Robin, but um, and it's not always good. The son of Annas the scribe was standing there with Joseph, and he took a branch of willow and with it dispersed the water which Jesus had gathered together. Now, I've never taken the time to go back and see what the original Coptic, the language of ancient Egypt, says here, but I love the English translation. When Jesus saw what he had done, he was enraged and said to him, You insolent, godless thunderhead. What harm did the pools and water do to you? See, now you also shall wither like a tree and shall bear neither leaves nor root nor fruit. And he withered the kid up. If you know your New Testament, <laughs> you can see where somebody got the idea for this from. Jesus does wither a fig tree, but he doesn't wither up people. 
He heals people with withered hands. And there are other stories that would fall into this category. Then there are a group that I've labeled supplements to the passion narrative of Jesus. What was Jesus thinking when he wasn't speaking to Pilate? What was going through his head on the cross? What happened when, at least as one branch of the church believed, he descended into hell between his death and resurrection? And you can read books with titles like the Acts of Pilate or the Gospel of Nicodemus that go into more detail on those stories. You can read a, a narrative like the Gospel of Peter that actually describes the resurrection. You know, in the Gospels, we have no idea what somebody with a, a camera would have seen when Jesus came out of the tomb. We just have the appearances that took place afterwards. But the Gospel of Peter describes three figures emerging from the tomb. Two angels whose heads reach to the clouds. And Jesus in between whose head came out above the clouds. Last time I checked, that's even taller than Goliath. <laughs> this is no longer a truly human Christ in these stories. It's a completely mythical type of picture. And then there are fragments. These are all short works. None of them spans Jesus' entire life. But then there are works that only fragments of which have been discovered. And so we find a scrap that has a version of Jesus healing the leper. Very similar to what we do read in our New Testament. Or we have additional conflicts with the Jewish leaders. Snippets, bits and pieces. Some of you remember in the mid-2000s when the Gospel of Judas was discovered. We had known about it from ancient church fathers. We had never actually seen a copy of it. It's only about 10 pages. It's only about the last week of Jesus' life. And it turns Judas into the hero. Because somebody had to betray Jesus. So Judas took the fall. Looked like he did a dastardly deed, but uh, God will reward him in heaven anyway. Completely inverting the biblical account. Then there's the Gnostic literature. These are not complete narratives of the life of Christ either. In fact, they're not narratives. They're not stories at all. So it's somewhat misleading even to put the label gospel on them. They tend to be lengthy discourses or sermons or collections of teachings of Jesus with almost no narrative introductions or conclusions that show Jesus speculating about the creation of the world and the nature of humanity and uh, well, the topics that Gnosticism in general was interested in, such as matter is inherently evil. Therefore, God did not create the world good only to have sin later corrupted. In fact, God did not create the world at all a force that came from God along with a variety of forces, good and evil, rebelled against God by creating the world and humanity. And therefore, the goal of human beings in order to return to a perfectly good universe is to rid ourselves of everything material and bodily. The Gnostics were a, a typical Greek philosophy that superimposed the Christian story on top of it. 
And they believed that uh, the fall, if you want to call it that, was the fact that we have lost the true knowledge of our Creator, which is restored by one of these impersonal forces that emanates from God known as wisdom. Gnostic, and it's spelled with a G. Gnosis in Greek is the root we get our word knowledge, uh, knowledge from. <laughs> and it was an elitist, secret, esoteric type of knowledge. If you were in the in-group, you knew that the goal of life was to get rid of the body. Redemption was not confessing your sin. Redemption is death, freedom from the body to live a disembodied life forever as an immortal soul. And so Jesus gets superimposed onto that story and that becomes the kind of redemption that he talks about. They're not narratives. The genre tends to be collections of sayings, and discourses, and topics that you hardly even see in the New Testament. With one exception, the most important one of all, that also was attributed to Thomas, but often called the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, so as not to confuse it with the Infancy Gospel. This is a collection of 114 sayings attributed to Jesus, largely without any connections between them. And what's intriguing is that about a third of them are very similar to sayings that we find in the New Testament. About another third are quite different, very clearly Gnostic, and slightly less than a third are cryptic enough that it's hard to know how the original author and readers interpreted them. You might be able to put an orthodox, historically Christian spin on them, or you might put a Gnostic spin on them, and it's hard to know. Allow me to read from some samples here. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which the twin, Judas Thomas, wrote down. And he said, Jesus that is, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all, A-L-L, -L, everything. Jesus said, if those who lead you say to you, see the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you it's in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will be known. And you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. If you're familiar with the Gospels, you recognize echoes of language, of text from the New Testament, but you also hear a lot about knowledge. And you hear things somewhere in between. Um, kingdom is inside and outside of you. Well, yes, there's an orthodox way that's true. And there's a Gnostic way to interpret that. And you can see why people have been fascinated with it. I realize that I uh, skipped over Dan Brown, but that's good. It's been about 10 years since the Da Vinci Code came out. Hopefully uh, the dust has settled by now. Um, for anybody who was uh, fascinated with it, um, there is one historical fact about the first 500 years of Christianity he got right. Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute. Other than that, everything is wrong. Ignore it. <laughs> so, uh, how do we evaluate 
these kinds of writings. And I want to leave a few minutes for questions, so I'm abbreviating, so I can also scratch where you might itch. In another talk that I sometimes give on the historical reliability of the four Gospels of the New Testament, I argue that one can come up with at least a dozen criteria, a dozen approaches that historians regularly take to ancient documents by which the Gospels emerge with, uh, with flying colors with respect to their reliability. Here, I take those same 12 criteria, or issues, or approaches, and apply them to the apocryphal and Gnostic Gospels. How many manuscripts do we have in the language in which they were written? For the New Testament, over 5,700. For the Gospel of Thomas, Half a dozen. For many of the other works, two. And for the remaining ones, one. And where we have two copies, they're usually remarkably different. Which makes us wonder if we even have anything like the original at all. Or maybe there wasn't care taken as there was with the New Testament to copy them carefully. Who wrote these documents? Were they in a position to report reliable information? We don't know. We know their dates. That's the next point. Second through sixth century. And mid-second century at the earliest possibly no earlier than the late second century. So we know the, the Christian figures they're attributed to didn't write them. We have no further information to suggest who did, but it's obvious that whoever did was trying to pass his work off as from the first century, as from the apostolic age, because he knew without that alleged link, it wouldn't convince anybody. So he didn't dare write his own name. Or her own name. We don't know. Is there a, an ideological spin? Is there a theological bias that uh, colors these documents in a way that would make us skeptical about their historicity? Yes, there is. Because Gnosticism believed that the material world was inherently evil, then Jesus could not have truly become human. He must have only appeared human seem to be human, and the Greek verb for to seem or to appear is dokeo, which gave rise in English to a word called docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. The view that Jesus was fully God, but not fully human. He only seemed to be human. And so it's okay to create all kinds of fanciful stories about Jesus, but he's not a credible human being in these accounts. That should cause great suspicion. We know that people in the ancient Mediterranean world in oral cultures where traditions were memorized and passed on at times for centuries by word of mouth, had uh, the great ability to uh, carefully preserve, even before information was written down, that which they particularly valued. We can trace an oral tradition of the four New Testament Gospels. There's no evidence that such a tradition ever existed for the apocryphal and the Gnostic literature, that people ever passed them on by word of mouth. 
There's also a literary relationship between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can see where they are at times verbatim the same. You can see where they are different. And you can make informed uh, guesses as to who came first and, and who followed whom. In the Gospel of Thomas, the only one of these texts that has recurring parallels to the New Testament, you can find ways in which every one of the four Gospels appears and has been altered, showing that they are later. They are dependent on, they are parasitic on the already existing canonical Gospels and not the other way around. We've mentioned their literary genre. They don't claim to be historical books. There's nothing like the opening verses of Luke, where Luke addresses Theophilus and says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that are accomplished among us, I too thought it good, having interviewed eyewitnesses and ministers of the word to write to you, so that you might know about the certainty of the things you've been taught. There's never a statement like that. In fact, the regular ploy of the apocryphal and the Gnostic Gospels is to say, these are secret words that Jesus taught one or a small group of his followers and told them to keep it under wraps until the appointed time. That's the only way you can even begin to plausibly convince anyone that it went back to Jesus, but for 150 years nobody's ever heard anything like this. Historians are naturally suspicious of that. There are all kinds of uh, hard sayings or embarrassing teachings in the Gospels that cut against the grain of some of the emphases of uh, their writers, which remind us that they weren't just playing fast and loose with history. There were things Jesus taught that were hard for people to come to grips with, but the Gospel writers in the New Testament didn't just leave them out. There are different kinds of embarrassing things in the Apocryphal and the Gnostic Gospels. They're fairly anti-Semitic. The Jewish God is not particularly a good God. And Jesus isn't tied too closely to the Jewish God. And Jesus not only comes into conflict with the Jewish authorities, but teaches some things that flatly contradict the New Testament. Here's one of the funnier ones. Gospel of Thomas saying 53, his disciples asked him, is circumcision beneficial or not? You recall they debated that in Acts 15 and other places in the New Testament. Well, this Jesus replied, if it were beneficial, their father would beget them already circumcised from their mother. <laughs> Rather, the true circumcision in spirit has become completely profitable. No time for any Jewish ritual here at all. Sometimes, intriguingly, it seems that it's the more radical, liberal, Christian feminists, or even secular feminists, who latch on to the Gnostic text because certain passages taken by themselves do highlight the role of Mary Magdalene as one of the leaders in the early church and Mary the mother of Jesus and at times some other women. But you really need to take them as a package. You need to read them all together. Allow me to read the last saying, saying 114 of the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Simon Peter said, Speaking of Mary Magdalene, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Well, we knew Peter was the first pope and not a good guy. 
No, no, erase that. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Shall we pray and have an altar call? <laughs> Are you feeling the spirit, ladies? I hope not. In the canonical gospels, there are topics that are absent altogether that were of significance in early Christian debate. And if the gospel writers had felt free, as some scholars claim, to make things up and attribute them to Jesus, you would have expected them to be there. There is a key missing topic in the apocryphal and Gnostic literature as well. We've already mentioned it. Jesus' true humanity. As one writer put it, Jesus walks as it were a few feet off the ground, not really a true human. What about non-Christian testimony? There are a dozen Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources that make reference to basic facts about the life of Jesus found in the four Gospels. There is one non-Christian document that alludes to anything in the Apocrypha and the Gnostic Gospels, and it's the Quran. In the 600s, Muhammad somehow heard about the little story, Jesus making the birds, and they flew away. And that's the only one that ever gets cited anyplace else. What about archaeology? Large books on the archaeology that makes sense of and confirms and correlates with the Gospels. There isn't even anything in these books that you could test archaeologically because there are no names of places, there are no dates, there are no other people that appear. It's hermetically sealed off from any kind of real-world corroboration. What about other Christian testimony? We get a fair amount here, particularly starting with Irenaeus in the late second century, who wrote a whole book called Against Heresies. Guess what one of them was? Docetism, as expressed in Gnosticism. Oh, the liberal scholars say, see, the church just suppressed these testimonies. And church history is written by the winners. Well, to a certain degree that's true, but are winners always wrong? Sometimes winners win because they offer something a whole lot better than the losers. And these winners were preserving the apostolic tradition of the first century, and little sects and pockets and groups of people came along and created these fanciful changes, and the church leaders said, No. Really? <laughs> Shut up. As our kids like to say. My conclusion is, you don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to be threatened by them. The next time somebody comes on the internet with a brand new theory that really isn't brand new, <coughs> wait for the dust to settle. Wait for the responsible scholars to weigh in. There'll be another Dan Brown. There'll be another Da Vinci Code. Who knows what's been There'll be something else on the uh, History Channel that isn't history. You might have noticed they do that in other topics, not just religion. <laughs> and sometimes they do responsible things. The Discovery Channel is a 
the same. Sometimes they discover things that aren't. <laughs> And don't be afraid of uh, not believing me. And reading the books for yourself. And deciding for yourself. And uh, I should leave a few moments for a few questions. If you'll raise a hand, keep it really brief and loud enough so that my almost 57-year-old ears can hear it. Oh, we have an MC. Is there a question in three? Yeah. <coughs> Would you address the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which is, I believe is Gnostic history and words, Jesus Christ? No, it's mostly just medieval fiction. Was <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ Mary, Mary, no, no evidence whatsoever. All made up. And the body of Messiah, people, Knights Templar were good. Oh, I'm sure there were some good people here and there, but it has nothing to do with biblical truth. Enjoy it for the fiction that it is. There's, there's no history there. <laughs> Who's next? Sarah is behind you looking for somebody to <laughs> wave their hand. Uh, my, my question is, is uh, kind of looking at both sides of the gospel. Yeah. And, and, and looking at the in our, our Bible. And you talked a little bit about the Catholic's Bible. Yeah. Um, years ago, as two scrolls were, yeah. hopefully, all that validated. Can you talk a little bit about what value those, sure. those things bring to us? Almost the identical time, 1947-48, Dead Sea Scrolls at a site called Qumran, the shores of the Dead Sea, were being discovered, which is why um, what was going on down in Egypt got overshadowed, and Dead Sea Scrolls are Jewish documents that span about 200 BC to about 70 AD, and um, they fall into two categories, copies of the Hebrew texts of what we call Old Testament books that showed how remarkably carefully, in general, the Hebrew Bible had been copied because some of those copies were a thousand years older than any previously known copies of the Hebrew books of the Old Testament. And the other body of literature that was found there were writings of the community themselves, uh, an Essene group, one of the sects of Judaism that was very separatistic, it was very pious, it thought that uh, even the rest of Judaism was too corrupt, and so they went out into the wilderness to start what we might call a utopian community and try to start over and to uh, gain God's favor. And so we can learn all kinds of fascinating information about uh, the nature, the beliefs, and the practices of this uh, Essene group. But uh, we don't learn anything about Christianity because these are pre-Christian Jewish documents. So we can learn a lot about second century Gnosticism, from what we talked about today, we can learn a lot about pre-Christian Judaism from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But uh, I remember a Channel 4 news reporter in the 90s who's now retired, and I won't embarrass him because some of you are old enough to remember him, who looked straight into the camera at one broadcast, reading obviously from the teleprompter, when the last fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls were finally published. And he said, looking very earnestly, some scholars believe these will undermine the very foundations of Christianity. Utter rubbish, as the British would say. Just bark, not a word of truth to it. And you notice we're still here. Sarah's got the mic. Doctor, could you address the issue of uh, dating of the Apocrypha and uh, the Gnostic Gospels in view of the fact that when the <coughs> canonical nature of them was determined, it was prior to carbon dating and things like that? At least that's my impression. Um, carbon dating has been around to, for quite a while, but uh, most of the uh, 
the uh, ways that uh, ancient writings tend to be dated, probably the most reliable approach is by uh, handwriting analysis. Just like if you have handwritten letters saved in your family from your grandparents, you will notice that uh, there were certain letters in a certain style to cursive English that was consistent but also just different enough that you could recognize this was done in the early 1900s and not much more recently. Um, if schools would still teach cursive, you could see it happen again. Um, usually you can date um, a document in ancient Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Coptic, Ethiopic, Armenian, Slavonic, and a bunch of other languages to at least a century by the style of handwriting. And sometimes you can get it down to about a half a century. Go ahead, Paula. Uh, short of giving oh, us your perfect. cell phone number, what do, you, <laughs> what do you propose for those of us who are just the average Joe yeah. and Jill? Um, when we hear some heresy or something that smells of it, and we think, but how do I refute that because it's a published book and, and these yeah. people seem very real? Can you develop a Snopes for Christian folks? Um, that's a great idea. I don't think it's what they're paying me to do. And, uh, I don't think I have enough time in my free time. What free time? Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say you see something that sounds far out and suspicious, be suspicious. And if it supposedly is some new discovery, expect the next two weeks to have the internet flooded with comments and surf a broad cross-section of them. And sooner or later, you'll start to see evangelical Christian scholars weighing in and see what they have to say. See if everybody seems to be in general agreement. Oh yeah, we, we probably did find the tomb of Herod the Great about four years ago, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. There's not a lot of debate about that. Um, we found a first century, we found the walls and foundation of a first century home in Nazareth just before Christmas in 2009. And the skeptics have been saying, there is no sign of any village in Nazareth in the first century or even a couple centuries on either side of it. Well, there's a bustling city there today. You can't just dig anywhere you want, as deep as you want, as long as you want. Um, you create the worst sinkholes for modern Nazareth ever. Um, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Think about that for a while. So just, uh, yeah. If, if you think you ought to be suspicious, be suspicious, and just keep watching and keep Googling, and the truth will come out. Power walking. I like power napping myself. But you had mentioned the Quran. How, how would you put the Quran up against these apocryphal and Gnostic uh, pieces of literature in terms of those criteria of, of yeah. believability? Well, first you have to know what's in it. And again, I would encourage you to get an English translation and dip into it, and then you can decide for yourself. You don't have to believe me or somebody who has a quite different opinion or an Orthodox Muslim. Quran is a, a consecutive arrangement of supposed revelations from God to Muhammad that are arranged from the longest to the shortest, so they're not in any kind of chronological order. And some of them do make reference to uh, historical events, occasionally events in the life of Muhammad, which we have no particular reason to doubt. Occasionally, two events found in the Old or New Testaments 
where sometimes a story is told somewhat similarly, but sometimes not. Um, Ishmael, for example, rather than Isaac, according to the Quran, is the line of God's promise, so that Arabs rather than Jews get to be the chosen people. And Jesus is revered as a great prophet, but only the second greatest the world has ever seen. The honor goes to Muhammad, of course. Um, so uh, there, there are bits and pieces that do allude to other historical things, but the vast majority of the Quran, the best way I can describe it is Jeremiah on steroids. <laughs> if you've ever read the book of Jeremiah, you have this prophet speaking in the name of God about everything the people are doing wrong and all of the judgment that's going to come on them until you're just tired of hearing it over and over and over again. Now, if there are any Muslim friends here, I apologize for that horrible caricature, but that is my sort of sweeping, generalized, overly simplistic reaction. Can you speak of current, modern-day Gnostic tendencies within modern evangelicalism? Ah, hopefully you were actually applied to us. <laughs> Usually people say, oh yeah, look at Christian science and religious science, and then, yeah, what about us? Well, in my lifetime, Christmas cantatas have gotten a lot better. <laughs> but when I was growing up, um, you didn't get much about, can I use an r word here? About Jesus the bastard and the stigma that would have followed him throughout life for anybody who didn't believe the story of the virgin birth, <laughs> which was also. And uh, you, didn't, you didn't get, to, especially with all the beautiful music and the kids dressed up, you, you didn't get the sights and sounds and smells of uh, an infant laid in a feeding trough for cattle, which is what a manger is. We just don't use the word in any other context. Nobody remembers what it really means. Um, in more recent years, I think even Chalkin Christian churches are doing a lot better to stress Jesus born into poverty, born among the outcast, living a life apart from all of the circles of power and influence, always under a cloud of suspicion, because he came to liberate people who are in all of those walks of life. Mm. He didn't come for the lovely and the beautiful and the rich and the famous. Oh, he'd be happy to save them. <laughs> but his focus was on the people that they oppressed and exploited. Mm. When I was a kid, just to sit in a pew, I wouldn't have been allowed to come to church like I am today. I would have had to put a coat and tie on. Well, at least by the time I was a teenager. Now, uh, if this was a younger audience, uh, well, you know how they dress. <laughs> and you know what? I think that's perfectly okay. It's not about how we look on the outside. Oh, I know, when you come to hear, when you come to see the king, you should be dressed in your finest. How about when you come to see your daddy? It's okay to come in diapers. And God is above. What counts is the attitude on the inside. You can look flawless on the outside and be horrible on the inside and vice versa. I think I'm rambling, and I think Bruce is showing me with his body language that it's probably time for me to quit. <laughs> <laughs>